the people of the town, whatever. So these old four, uh, these four olds, you know, smashed old ideas. There were also struggle sessions. I talked a little bit about this. Uh, people who were suspected of betraying the revolution or were capitalist rotors were taken to a public area, criticized, criticized, admitted, or uh, were, you know, themselves would ha admit self-criticism. But it's also important to note this was even practiced among Red Guards. They would talk to each other and say, "How am I, not, how am I not supporting the revolution?" And they would criticize. Well, you know, when we were with those peasants, you were you were very haughty. You know, you you looked down on them because you were from the city and you were educated, and they were just peasants. And they would say, you know what, you're right. And also, I, you weren't there for that, but I was also um, rude to uh, a soldier in the PLA. And I, sh I really should not be so rude to other working class people. And so they would have these massive criticism and self-criticism sessions. Um, I, you know, just not that I really encourage anyone to read it unless you've got a, a strong stomach and you really don't feel like um, doing something more productive with your time. But there's this really funny story that simultaneously, one, shows the culture of the Cultural Revolution, and two, also shows why so many Westerners can't understand Maoism, is the Black Book of Communism. It has, the Black Book of Communism is this anti-communist book that you know, lays out how terrible communism was. And they have a section on China like they do on all other communist countries. And there's this story, and they can't figure it out. The editors of this book, just can't figure it out. And they, they say something like, you can see the madness of Mao's cultural revolution by this example told to us by this guy. And this guy um, was a political prisoner who was a capitalist rotor. And, um, and of course, so he was getting an education in Maoism. And one thing they point out is, in these political prisons, the law of the land was you were not to strike prisoners. You were not to hit them. You were not to torture them. And so what happened is, it was nighttime, it was cold, he was in his tent, and um, the rule was you had to go to the fence to pee, to urinate. And so he tells the story about how he, it was cold, he didn't want to do it, he snuck out of his tent, and he just went a little further while, and started peeing on the side of the tent. And then as soon as he finished, he felt someone hit in the back. You know, he got hit in the back and he fell to his knees. And you know, it was a, a red guard, you know, prison guard who was like, look what you're doing, you know? You have no respect for us, you have no respect for the camp, you're, you know, you're, you're not following the rules, you have no respect for us, you have no respect for the revolution, you have no respect for Chairman Mao, you're, look at this, you're just flouting the rules. And, you know, of course, not wanting to suffer more of abuse, either physical or verbal, he says, he, you know, he thought very quickly, he's like, well, there's also a rule to not strike prisoners. And you have violated that, so who has violated the worst rule? Me, for simply taking care of a natural function in a very, very cold winter night, very close, because I, it's, it's really hard to go out there. Or you, who has power and have abused your power by hitting me. The guard just glared at him. You're absolutely right. I apologize for hitting you. Um, I, will, I will take this to the guards, and I will state this in my next criticism and self-criticism. And so he did just that. The guards themselves had criticism and self-criticism lecture or sessions where he said, I should not have hit this prisoner. Um, I was frustrated and he was urinating in, in the camp and I shouldn't have hit him. That was not the proper way to do things and I was wrong and I will not do that anymore. So you have a prison guard. Could you imagine? Imagine you go to prison anywhere in the United States. Could you ever imagine any prison guard ever for any reason for any rule that they broke and were not caught by either another prison guard or a prison warden, apologizing to a prisoner. Not just apologizing to them, publicly apologizing in a self-criticism like uh, uh, you know, circle for doing wrong to a prisoner. And that's the sort of, I mean, it's stories like these that really capture what the Cultural Revolution meant. It was a real revolution of culture. You had people acting in ways that never before had we seen on the face of the earth. And so it was, you know, a, a real revolution. Well, going on, um, so the Red Guards, right, are going to be there, um, you know, throughout 66. In 67, you have the July Storm. It's an expansion of the Red Guards. Lin Biao, who is the new head of the People's Liberation Army, 
And uh, Zhang Xing, which again is Mao's wife, expanded criticisms against the corrupt officials, and they pushed this line strongly through the Red Guards. The Red Guards began pulling down officials left and right. And you know they put in new officials. If those new officials do anything that people don't like, they pull them back down again. And so in many, in many places, the government grinds to a standstill um, because they're too busy, like grinds to a standstill. I mean, this is one of the, the central questions. What is the point of communism? And uh, so if it's about having a super efficient government where you know, the trains run on time, and that's the only thing that matters, then it was a really inefficient time. But if the meaning of communism is to have worker control, worker participation on all levels, from the very bottom to the very top, right? This is exactly what was going on. Well, very quickly, uh, many of the generals in the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, became very anxious about the authority and actions of the Red Guard, and they also, too, were replaced. Well, here's where things start to uh, veer towards the crazy. Um, because the PLA has no authority, the Red Guards begin raiding armies barracks and literally taking weapons from the PLA. So this gives us, this, this goes through 67. By late 67, you have Red Guards literally engage in open warfare against each other, against other worker movements, against the party itself, and even, um, you know, against, you name it. Um, in fact, one of the, uh, going back, um, back to uh, Xinjiang University where the Red Guards started, um, there was literally two bands of Red Guards who had occupied the university that were engaged in street fighting within the university against each other. And Mao actually called for the working uh, association. Um, I, I think it was the One Million Heroes against the revolutionary workers or something like that. He called for workers from the uh, local uh, metal plant to break it up. And so the workers, you know, not armed, came in and said, you know, you guys need to disarm. You're killing each other. This isn't helping the revolution. And it ended in bloodshed that left, you know, like 20 or 30 workers injured or dead. So with this spiraling out of control, um, there's a move to restore order. In 68. So that's domestically, things have gotten completely out of hand. Ostensibly. Uh, I mean, there's, there's questions about this. But there's also things going on internationally. Um, the Soviet Union, in Czechoslovakia, you had an uprising of workers and students and pro Western, pro capitalist intellectuals. Like it was a mixed movement. And what happened is the Soviet Union moved in and crushed it. Um, and uh, the PRC became really uncomfortable with this. You had border skirmishes growing between the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. And you even previously had a denunciation of the Soviet Union as just as bad as the United States, as a form of state capitalism. Well, this is causing 